So here we are in Luke 11. As I said, this is the last gospel that mentions the parable of binding the strong man. And starting in verse 14, it says he was casting out devils and he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven, as if that wasn't a sign. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. Wow. Every kingdom that is divided against itself is laid waste. And a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Now, look how in Luke, how it starts out first, not with the devil's division and uh, a king, you know, Satan against Satan will be utter foolishness because his kingdom will fall. In Luke, how it is recorded, I find it very natural for the people to listen because he first speaks to them on their level. Every kingdom against itself is laid waste. Well, I'm sure when they heard the word kingdom, they're thinking of Rome, they're thinking of Herod, they're thinking of natural kingdoms, and of course, they would, hmm, they would understand that division. They would understand the rising and falling of emperors and that type of, of plundering of a kingdom by a stronger kingdom coming in. And a divided household falls. Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And a divided household falls. And if Satan, now he brings up Satan, since that's what they accused him of, casting out devils by the devil. And if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? That question again. Therefore, they will be your judges, your own children, your own sons, who cast out devils. But look at this, verse 20. And this is the only gospel that uses this type of language, this wording here. But if it is by the finger of God I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The finger of God. In Mark it says, by the Spirit of God. When you, in this setting, he's saying, be careful what you're saying. You know on a rational, logical, political level, any kingdom divided falls, any household that's filled with division is laid to waste. It, it, it just cannot stand. He's saying you understand the power of division. So in the kingdom of darkness, you think Satan rises up against himself? No. But let me read that again in verse 20. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Beautiful. And then he says in verse 21, when a strong man, fully armed, okay, we're getting a different picture now, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him 
and overcomes him and takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. And then the familiar statement, whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Now in Luke, I love the picture about the strong man. First, when a strong man, he's, this strong man in the way he describes is fully armed. Okay, that's it. There's nothing more that he can do to protect his goods and his palace. He's fully armed, not half armed, fully armed, okay? And he guards his own palace. His goods are safe, all right? Fully armed, there's guarding happening by being fully armed, and his goods are safe. But when? But when, hallelujah, but when God shows up, when Jesus showed up, but when one stronger than he, the fully armed strong man, someone stronger comes in and attacks him and overcomes him and takes away his armor in which he trusted this one describes taking away armor and what he trusted in. It's the same in all the Gospels, but the wording here is, uh, it creates a different picture for you. He takes away, he, he is stronger, he attacks him, he overcomes him, and takes away his armor that he trusted in. And then divides his spoils. Now, Satan is fully armed and guards his own kingdom. A stronger one attacks him, overcomes him, binds him and takes away his armor and that he trusted in. That's Christ, hallelujah. Well, let's compare this, the armor of the strong man that he fully trusted in with the armor of God that we began a few weeks ago teaching on and I have reiterated and brought up numerous times in this teaching. So the armor of God is a metaphor in the Bible, I'm sure written seeing Roman soldiers and seeing actual soldiers and the armor that they wore and using what was around them and also trying to describe the glorious weaponry of God uh, that we have in Christ. We are not left naked in battle. We are fully clothed in his glory, in his grace, with prayer, praise, the name of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, the word of God, angels, and, and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, hallelujah. So let's just go back and look at the armor of God from Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 which reminds us about the reality of a spiritual battle and warfare. This armor describes the protection and weapons available to us because of the atonement, because of Christ, hallelujah. And I've said it before, I love that it's placed in chapter six or at the end of this letter because chapter one, the beginning part of Ephesians and chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, leading to chapter 6, or leading to the, the final chapter of this letter, what is the foundation of our armor is the theology and the doctrines of Christ and the glory of identity in Christ and, and the empowerment that is described in Ephesians to the church. Hallelujah, the church, the, the voice of God speaking we proclaim the word is what I mean. His gathered people proclaiming the word of God, the power that's there in the gathered, the redeemed ones gathering, the redeemed ones all over the world proclaiming the word of God and knowing who we are in Christ. The, the, de the devil, he trembles. Do you know you scare the devil when you have knowledge of who you are in Christ, that you are his beloved, that you actually scare him? And so the more revelation you have of the atonement, 
of of what Jesus did, read Ephesians chapter one, two, three, and you'll go, oh my gosh, look what, look, look what Christ has done. He has redeemed us, he has restored us to the Father, he has reconciled us, he has cleansed us, given us great promises. I mean, we are empowered, hallelujah. And first and foremost, we are forgiven. So, all right, so this armor, what we'll do, as we look at the armor of God again, we'll do the opposite. What is the armor that Satan trusts in? Now we know what Satan trusts in is um, hate and pride, any work of the flesh, that's what he will, will gravitate toward. Um, he sees a weakness in us, strife of course, so we know that hate, pride, arrogance, strife, perversion, works of the flesh are tools in the devil's hands for our destruction. Bitterness, that's why forgiveness is so beautiful. You may not like what someone did to you, and you don't ever have to, but forgiveness is just releasing it to God. Father, I don't want this bitterness in me. And I'm never, I would never say it happens in a, it may happen in a moment in a prayer, but we don't always feel that we are joyfully like, oh, there's that person that helped destroy my family or my business. Um, we don't have glee about it, never. There's horrible things that happen, but forgiveness frees your own soul. God will judge them. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. We just release that person. Yes, if it's a crime, go through the courts, do what you have to do in that arena, but ultimately still, may God help us all to forgive so we're not laden and, and beat up with the past and, and have bitterness in our gut, you know, so, so we can heal. Praise God. Um, so we know that hate, pride, arrogance, strife, perversion, works of the flesh are tools in the devil's hands for our destruction, as well as uh, false doctrines, and those two are destructive. The epistle of James says where there is strife and envy, there is every evil work, or strife and contention, there is every evil work. So evil work is invited in through all sorts of avenues, and that is why being humble before God you know, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. As you submit to God, what a beautiful act of humility before our king. So the first part of the armor of God in Ephesians 6 is, is being girded with truth. Girded to be surrounded with truth or the belt of truth. Well, the opposite of that, what the enemy, the weapon, or the armor he would trust in are lies and deception. But we know the truth. Jesus is the truth. And so we are girded about with truth. That is our weapon, but what he trusts in, he's fully armed in lies and deception. The second part of this armor is the breastplate of righteousness, that we are truly made righteous by the blood of Christ. As Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness, so it is all through the book of Romans that the gift of righteousness is given to those who believe and we are made righteous praise God the opposite of that would be you are worthless and you can never be loved by God you can never be righteous well in our flesh no but it's a gift and God makes us righteous so Satan trusts or his armor is that you are loathsome and you never feel loved and that is totally opposite of the breastplate of righteousness. Three, the gospel of peace. Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The opposite of that would be what the, the enemy trusts in. Would be his armor would be turmoil, condemnation. There is never peace. You don't deserve peace. You will never receive peace. But that is totally the opposite of the gospel. Number four is the shield of faith. Hallelujah. There is a shield, and it's called the shield of faith, by which we quench all the fiery 
darts of the enemy or the, the schemes or the, what Satan would throw at us, this shield of faith, believing in God. Praise God. The opposite of that would be, of course, what he trusts in is unbelief and doubt, worry, fear, and anxiety. And how can you trust God? He will disappoint you. He's not faithful. And God is faithful. And God is everything his word declares him to be, a faithful, merciful God who will never leave us nor forsake us. Then we have number five, the helmet of salvation. I love that because everything starts with salvation, the helmet. You know, your mind is renewed by the Word of God. Salvation has come to our spirit, soul, and body, everything. Well, I know our body is, um, is death-doomed, but our spirit man is alive. And, and God, what I mean by that, though, we pray for healing. You know, yes, we are growing older and one day we'll leave this body. But in the meantime, we pray for healing and strength and that God would, would bless our days. Amen. And so the helmet of salvation speaks of all the goodness of God and all that God has done, the atonement and the blood, and, and, and that we are right with God because of Christ, that we are not saved by works, lest any man should boast, but we are saved by grace through faith. Amen. And the opposite of that is condemnation, lost, hopelessness, and, and you, are, you are always insecure if you can be atoned. You know, there are some beliefs and religions that no one, they don't even know if they're saved. They have no idea. They have no assurance of salvation. We have assurance of salvation in Christ. Six it would be the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praise be unto God. All of these are incredible teachings on their own, so I know I am not doing justice by them, just recapping like this, but we'll close this teaching like this because, again, that is a full teaching on the armor of God and it will take you all through the scriptures. But the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, I, I ask you to go back to John chapter 1 that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and He was in the beginning with God and He is called the Word of God. That is our sword. We speak the Word. The Word is alive. It's living. It's powerful. This Word. And so the opposite of that would be you have no foundation, nothing to trust in, no words of life. Well, that would be the the word, the spirit of the Antichrist. There's just no hope but in man, no hope but in philosophers. Oh, our hope is in the living God. Yes, there are good teachers out there, and you know, there's positive teachers, and all of that is wonderful, but nothing like the Word of God and the hope of the Word of God. Praise the Lord. And so, the Word of God. Satan would tell you is useless. The word means nothing. And what happens, you may not even know you're leaning that way, but if you are not loving the word and standing on the word and declaring the word and studying the word, you won't know the word. And you won't know these great promises. There are great promises in the word of God. And, and then you're you can be swayed by rewriting the word, just reading occasionally the word or picking and choosing verses that you like. And God wants us to love all of the word, study it. And that's why I went a bit slow in reading Mark and slowing down and let's study the word together. And the word of God is powerful. And if you will trust the word of God, and speak the word of God, you will have miracles. And Satan does not want you to believe the word of God. And then if he can't convince you, well, the word, just throw it away. He'll want you to, like I said, pick and choose or water it down or become politically correct with the word. And, and that's not so. Well, I will end there. And the last is prayer. And Satan does not want you to pray. Ever does he want you to pray. But we pray. We ha There's all kinds of prayer. And the reverse of that is murmur, complain, and never pray. He wants you to be so busy you don't have time to pray. 
but God, one of the armor here is to pray. And Satan, what Jesus did, he took away the armor that the strong man trusted in. Satan is defeated. He is a defeated foe and we fight him. I know it seems like an oxymoron when we say that because we know his, it's very evident of his destruction and the horror of the enemy. But what Jesus did on the cross, what Jesus did in his life and decrees and preaching and healings was to let us know we have power of the enemy. No, he is not banished completely. We are not in heaven yet, I know that. But we fight from a place of victory. We are not afraid of him. We, we rise up against all of his works in Jesus' name. Remember, love, mercy, compassion, hope, these two are weapons against the enemy. Well, the Lord bless you. There's more to say. There's always more to say. And the next time we meet, we'll talk about the different, um, the different scriptures that say why Jesus came. God bless you.